was ich dir noch angesäche, so bist du sie alle Ehre. Was ist Wundes hier geschäche? Das ein Magd, ein Kind This is the new right, a podcast for the lost starts, reclaiming the literary holy land from the heathen. This is Dan Baltic. And this is Matt Pegas. And we are here on episode 84. Very uh it's it's been a long journey, Matt. Good to be here. Yes. Where uh um, it's been not just a long journey for us, but for the country. We are yeah. nearing the 2024 election, a, a time for choosing, as they say. And <laughs> uh, there's two two very interesting choices on the menu. We have, um, well, we have uh, cat and we have, no, no, I'm joking. Cat is not on the <laughs> menu. Uh, well, you know, maybe it is. I don't know. Well, we'll talk about it. But uh, what we're ostensibly talking about <laughs> today is... Um, an article that I wrote for my Substack, danbaltic.substack.com. The Baltic State is the name of the Substack. The name of the article is The Decline of the Jest, not the West, the Jest, which <laughs> is itself a review of esoteric Trumpism by Konstantin von Hofmeister. And uh, this is a very, uh, we, we've had Constantine on the pod. Uh, we've, we've both been on Constantine's pod. Uh, he right. is the, uh, the public, the editor-in-chief of Arctos uh, Journal, the, the website for Arctos. And um, he wrote this very tidy uh, little book, which uh, analyzes Trump and Trumpism from several literary and philosophical traditions. It's uh, it has a foreword by Rag Nationalist. It has an introduction by James Kirkpatrick. Uh, big guys on our side of Twitter. Big guys generally. Rag, you know you you know now that he's doxxed, you, we know he's a big guy. And <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, it's a good book. It you know it really yep. kind of uh, summarizes a lot of you know interesting arguments about uh, Trump as a man, Trumpism as a uh, that's a theory to to the extent it is a theory, and um, yeah, we I think we both enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. I cop this book back in March when Constantine was visiting. United States, Los Angeles, as well as Las Vegas. And, um, you know, the book, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a, it's a tight, slim volume um, with a lot of good stuff in it, kind of analyzing Trump from a Lovecraftian uh, and other, uh, you know, standpoints, kind of tying with the American literary traditional in, in, in an interesting way. We talked uh, to Constantine about this so people can, can listen to that interview. I think today we're going to focus more on Trump the man and use the book as a springboard. But I'll say, you know, it's a tight little volume. Very good, uh, very, very like memeable sort of object, very meme worthy art on the front page. And yeah, the lead ins from Kirkpatrick and Raw Egg certainly set the stage immensely well. Um, and yeah, at the time of getting this, you know, there's this thing you know, like if you support Trump, you know, um, and if you've been doing so since 2016, there's obviously that the meme energy of that year um, has never quite been able to be replicated um as these things go you know I, I won't even obviously you got you get reality pilled about trump at a certain point but it's I, I i wouldn't even say that the energy died off due to any um and any policy reasons or anything to do with trump's performance per se just there's a natural uh ebb and flow to these things 
Mm-hmm. Um, but so, so in getting this book in March, um, it was, a, you know, it felt uh, not in a forced way, but it was like, oh, this is kind of a recapture, uh, recapturing a little bit of recontextualization of, you know, Trump 2024, you know, after the slog of, of 2020 and everything, not Trump's fault, but, you know, after many, so many years of be, him being in the headlines, this was, this was, uh, you know, a, 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 a recall to, to an earlier context of his, of his meme worthiness, uh, as it were. Uh, but, uh, you know, I say that the energy isn't what it necessarily was in 2016. And it is, of course, different. But um, a lot has happened even since March uh, when I first picked up this book. I think that's the kind of the tenor of, of your article, The Decline of the Jest. That's kind of the meaning of the name of it. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's not that the energy is like 2016 exactly, but it's, it, you know, in, in some ways it's a lot less funny. The Decline of the Jest, is, 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 as you say, but it, but it is. The energy is very real and the stakes are very high and anyone, um, you know, everyone must see it that way. So what we're referring to here when we say the stakes are very real, the energy is very high. um, I think what we're referencing is uh, not just the general condition of the politics, not just the the import of um, Election Day and this election, but uh, literally, uh, back in um, I guess July it was uh, they they tried to shoot Trump in the in the head, and yeah. <laughs> there was an assassination attempt, uh, right. and and a subsequent one as well. They, yeah, and they and they, two weeks they ago actually, now. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. And then the first one they succeeded, in, you know they shot him through the ear, and right. so that to me was I wrote about it in the article. It was a real kind of shocking moment. I remember what I was doing. I was, um, in fact, I was writing that cranker too. I was writing that cranker too at that very moment. And it's one of the only times I don't look at my phone. I don't look at my phone when I'm sleeping. And I don't look at my phone when I am uh, writing because it it distracts me. And, um, but I heard a text come in. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm, you know, I'm writing, but I hear a text. And I'm like, fine, I'll, I'll check it. And um, it's my girlfriend yeah. telling me that, uh, did you see that Trump got shot? And I, you know, immediately I went, oh right. my God. Like my heart kind of sank because, you know, usually you got shot. You're, you're, in, you know, you're in bad trouble, buddy. And, uh, and when I yeah. heard that he got shot in the head, that was even worse. I'm like, Oh, no, I'm gonna and so like, I, you know, I really, you know, it's been kind of eight years that we've had Trump in our lives as you know, this kind of larger than life <laughs> yeah. political figure. And, you know, I don't, uh, he's not a personal friend i don't know him i you know generally have good feelings that way toward sometimes. him yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but like you know I, I really did kind of make me feel you know very sad that you know i'm okay i'm about to log on to twitter and see you know not just you know sad that you know the guy i want to win is you know maybe he's, he's dead but um mm-hmm. you know the that this this guy who you know is very funny very you know uh inimitable he you know there's no one like him and i thought i'm going to log in and i'm going to see his head blown apart and instead i see um this guy is raising his fist in the air his blood streaming from his ear his secret service agents are holding him back and so i'm looking at this and i'm like okay i guess he did get shot. Um, I don't know how bad it is. Maybe he will die. I don't know. But he like he looks really, um, you know, defiant. He looks like he's really, uh, you know, not uh, he, he's not about to, you know, keel over. And yeah. uh, indeed, that that was the case. He, um, you know, he got, as we know, he got shot through the year, but he immediately like popped back up and, you know, raised his fist and said fight 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 fight. and the yeah the secret service agents they looked like they were holding him back and they were he was like trying to like you know get out there and you know it it seemed almost like i wrote in the article like he was ready to run into the crowd and and apprehend the uh the assassin in the fashion that um i used to joke about school shooters and yeah 
Yeah, well, I was going to say in the fashion that uh, Andrew Jackson once, uh, oh, yeah. I think on the steps of Congress, someone tried to assassinate him, the gun jammed. And so Jackson, you know, then president, set upon the guy. And Jackson was in his 60s, probably. And he started beating the shit out of him with his cane. Wow. And they had to pull, yeah. yeah, they had to pull Jackson off this guy before he killed him. Um, so yeah. yeah, that it was it felt like that type of energy watching Trump do this. I uh well, what did you think, Matt? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, my process of this was less stressful than yours. I think by the time I think I it all happened fast for me and i don't know if that's because i was late to it or we were just getting information at different rates i was in a coffee shop i think it was also kind of preparing to write as it were i was about to start and um or do something i don't know i was working uh and and then at first i it was just like there was a, a kerfuffle um it's an ostensible like kerfuffle at the rally and i was like oh that's typical and then i was like oh like someone shot at trump and i don't know i feel like within about 30 seconds i saw the fight 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 video like there was not i think there i think there may have been like 10 seconds where it was like oh trump was shot possibly in the head is he gonna die and then me realizing he was okay and everyone essentially celebrating uh, it might have been a little bit while, a little after that, where we like really learned it was okay that it was just through the year. But I mean, if you're getting up and saying fight, 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 you're probably not mortally wounded. It all happened very fast. But I, but so for me, the, the the anxiety pretty much gave way very quickly to I don't want to say excitement because obviously it's terrible that this happened. Um, yeah. Even Biden, you know, at the time thought it was terrible that it happened because, or even even people, well. I'm not even to go down that pathway. Obviously, some people do wish Trump ill, but you know, there's this kind of more centrist opinion of like yeah. this is very dark, and you know, everyone kind of did feel that. But for me, it was it was, you know, that gave way very quickly to a sense of uh, admiration and awe um, at Trump, and then like more cynically, like um, just like that picture, you know, that's gonna win because I want him to win the election. You know, that's that's amazing. You know. PR, as it were, which yeah. it is, and they're kind of trying to bury it now, or not bury it per se. I think there has been some, you know, narrative control. I mean, needless to even say that they don't want us to remember this as, as is a bit of a meme on Twitter to repost it, talking about it as the only image that matters in 2024. Um, but yeah, yeah. The, I mean, you know, this 9 11 way, like, yeah, I was, I was in the coffee shop. I, I just tweeted moments before because I bought a, um, I don't want to talk about this extensively on the pod, but in terms of the the circumstances of where one was when a notable thing happened, I just bought an electric car and I had tweeted like the um, the South Park Prius episode smug alert. Uh, you know, <laughs> I had tweeted that and I thought it'd be funny. Um, the tweet didn't end up doing a lot of, uh, tr- you know, didn't get a lot of traction because I literally tweeted that moments before this story broke and that's all anyone talked about i think i even i I didn't delete it because i kind of don't believe in deleting tweets but i was like oh wow i just posted like almost almost almost, you know making fun of a more shit lived thing i did (laughs) and then this happened um but yeah i I say that just to set the stage and and then yeah the rest of it was yeah just following the news and seeing and following the memes and yeah basically i guess long too long didn't read is uh you know i moved very quickly from being anxious to to thinking like wow this is a really amazing and affirmative thing that has now happened i, I feel bad I, maybe i shouldn't say it that way because it is bad but you get what i mean like the energy no, was no, but I, I know what you mean yeah 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 the energy ended up being great yeah it a lot of people have discussed it many people are saying <laughs> many people <laughs> are saying that uh this is the return of meme magic that, you know, right. he's raising his fist. It's like, and as we were discussing, you know, earlier, just now, 2016, meme magic seems to, you know, have uh, faded, but like, but Trump is back, baby. The meme magic is back. And my sense of this, as I outlined in the article, the decline of the jest, is that, uh, yeah, maybe meme magic is back. I think it is, but I think it's more than that. I think, you know, whatever. So for me, and I mentioned this in the article, I, um, 
I, I'll be honest. I didn't think Trump had it in him. I did not think he was the type of guy who, like, after being shot at, would jump up and pump his fist in the, the air and say, fight, fight, fight. He's, you know, a New York City businessman. This is not like a, uh, you know, uh, Appalachian Medal of Honor winner. This is not the type of guy who's just like kind of um, undaunting in the face of physical danger. At least I didn't think. But, um, you know, this certainly was a moment of great, uh, not just, you know, moral, but physical courage. And that Absolutely. did kind Yeah. of shock me. And that, Yeah. that, you know, changed my conception of who Trump is exactly. And also my conception of, to some extent, what Trump might be capable of. over the course of a second administration. Yeah, no, no, 100%. Um, I mean, was I surprised? I don't know. But Keep in mind, like this a short time ago, people were wondering if Trump even wanted to run in 2024. And he obviously um, has, has that strong spirit. Uh, yeah, certainly. I mean, I guess I, I never really doubted. I'm not saying that as a as a one up, uh, but I never really doubted. But certainly it, it re um, redoubled my my confidence. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think is, you know, appropriate. It, um, you know, I, I think, so, I mean, there's a lot to say, and I, I think we do want to get into Trump as, um, as an artist, because this Yeah. is new, right? We want to get into all of that. But I, I think there is a lot to say about how the past four years of um, prosecutions and, you know, various trials and tribulations that Trump has been put through that uh, that may have changed him somewhat. And even his tone after the shooting, people have remarked about how it's more restrained, how it's more, um, you know, thoughtful. And, you know, I wonder to what extent does, you know, To what extent has Trump become to, you know, return to the uh, the phrasing and the framework of esoteric Trumpism in esoteric Trumpism, uh, von Hofmeister, Constantin analyzes Trump through a lot of different lenses. One of those lenses is the Spenglerian lens. And he, uh, you know, questions or wonders whether Trump is a uh, cesarean figure. whether he's one of the strong men who emerges at the decline of a civilization to bring it back, to renew it, to kind of defeat the, uh, the oligarchs who, you know, eventually uh, co-opt the spirit of a people. And, um, you know, I, if, if the guy who put his, pumped his fist in the air and shouted, fight, 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 If that's the guy who is going to be president, I think, yeah, maybe he does have the, um, you know, the fight in him to uh, to do the things that, you know, some people uh, would say need to be done, which is not, you know, Yeah. becoming necessarily a strongman dictator, but it is, you know, in some respects, uh, reordering the way the the government works the same way FDR Yeah. did the same way uh LBJ did you know there's like there are deep structural problems in our government that you know need to be addressed and you know some stuff needs to be torn down some stuff needs to be built and Mm -hmm. you know Trump um previously the previous administration Did a lot of good stuff, but, you know, he, he did, to some extent, get rolled. He, you know, Right. he appointed people who he, you know, weren't really on his side. They fed him, you know, uh, information and, you know, proposed actions that would not help him implement his policies. And, uh, and indeed, you know, it, it was... You know, it, his policies were nascent at the time. I think, you know, it it is 
Some people say that he ran as a publicity stunt uh, in 2016. Yeah. I think there um, there is something to that. He, I, mean, I don't well, think he yeah, expected I wanted to, to talk win. About that, but yeah, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think so either. Um, yeah, no, a couple things to unpack when you said. There, um, we all know Project 2025 is not really a Trump thing. It's Heritage Foundation. It's pretty much nothing, little to nothing to do with it. And it's kind of this, you know, talking point right before, I think, the shooting and right before Kamala replaced Biden and everything else that's gone on. Project 2025 was like their talking piece. That kind of fell by the wayside. I saw it kind of come back in the past few weeks, which to me is like, oh, maybe, maybe you know, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a sign that their other tricks are not working for to go back to 2025. Project 2025. The point being, that's not actually his plan. I don't I, I Maybe this is my own lack of reading or maybe it's, you know, Trump is often a little bit nonspecific about the details. I don't exactly know what like his day one in office, you know, there's a stupid figure turn of phrase. But, you know, I don't I don't know what his first 60 day in office plan is. But I certainly think that selecting J.D. Vance, as he did a mere few days after the attempt, assassination attempt, um is is a good indicator that he's surrounding himself with better people which is you know if there's any this has sort of become folk wisdom but i think there's truth that you know in addition you know getting as far as he got rolled as you said uh, a lot of it i think does have to do Mm. with not having good people around him um that seems to be amended Uh, of course i don't remember if we talked about this offline or on other pod there's a sense that in addition to i'm sure genuinely really liking vance um that he went with the more based option uh to deter assassination attempts which is a very <laughs> frightening so. uh thought but it's probably there's probably some truth to that um anyhow and then the other thing i was gonna so you know i i don't have the the real you know the real version of project 2025 in front of me but i but i do agree you know that the display you know the the strength that he showed and and the decisions he's made subsequently uh, certainly indicate good things that, that maybe he really can do this and that we should be excited at the prospect of a, of a potential second term. Um, the other thing that you mentioned, and this uh, doesn't contradict that, is that I do think Trump is this figure who's, you know, if he is indeed cesarean, it's um, has so many things in history and in life are, you know, it's a it's it's an odd, you know, it's God working in strange ways, as it were, um, to bring this about. Because I do, I don't think he ran as a publicity stunt, but I do, yeah, I think it's kind of well known that he didn't really expect to win in 2016. Um, mm-hmm. What I heard, uh, you know, because I brought this up earlier, like this question of whether or not he actually wanted to run in 2024. I mean, I, I, my, I've heard, and to me, this is not bad, but I've heard that, like, there was a sense that he wasn't, like, really necessarily wanting to um because it's of course exhausting and sometimes people try and blow your head off there's a million reasons why he might not want to um but has been kind of pulled into this strange position i think yes i think sort of spiritually where he realizes like he is the guy he knows he's the guy clearly um that helms you know what was once called the republic it's the republican party but it's more than that right it's the spirit of this whole half of america he realizes yeah. he's the only one for that job. So he, he has to rest the occasion. But also the, the other side and the would-be assassins have also played a role in like, because um, before the assassination, I, without being too polemical here, without, you know, trying to be too, without trying to be too fiery even, I think there is a sense that this assassination is just, uh, these assassination attempts are just, are kind of of the same tenor of the of the legalistic means that have been you know that people have tried to use to, to silence and mute him and and neutralize him for the past you know since 2020 um you know i do view them of, uh, as of the same thing i know that's a more republican trump supporting opinion i wouldn't expect most normie centrists to necessarily agree but but no i think it's all it's all part of the same thing you know they there's this desperation to stop him by any means necessary that the left even the central left i think thinks they're morally justified in but that Certainly on the right, and I would like to think, and on um, election day this year, we shall see, you know, I'd like to think that a lot of more normie centrist types would agree um, that that they're that that this just this desperation to stop him is not becoming and that it's it's becoming quite undemocratic to use a word that they throw at him and um, just in every way quite ugly. Um, so where was I going with that? Just that he's yes, mm-hmm. I think he's 
cesarean or potentially a cesarean figure, but he has been forced into it by history in a funny way and, and by his enemies in a funny yeah. way. Yeah. Well, very much like Caesar himself. Caesar was out like, you know, winning battles in Gaul and um, the Roman Senate did you know decided that they i mean my roman history is not the best I'm, <laughs> I'm not the i'm not the good old boys here who are big into roman history yeah but um from what i understand the senate condemned him on a number of kind of spurious charges similar to how trump has been condemned and um said you, you gotta come back to rome and you know face yeah. the consequences and I guess he had a few options then. He could have said, you know, F you guys, I'm never coming back. I'm going to hang out in Gaul with my army. Or, uh, and eventually they would have sent legions to, you know, fight and kill him. Uh, or they, or he could have come and like thrown himself on their mercy and they would have, you know, probably still killed him. Mm -hmm. um, but instead, you know, famously he had the crossing the Rubicon moment right. where he, he uh you know with his legion he came back to rome he was not supposed to take his legion with him that was seen as you're not supposed to you know have march your army into the city that's seen as you know um treason so but right. he did it anyways because he knew what he was facing and he crossed the rubicon and uh that was you know analogous to the current situation i think in the sense that Caesar, Julius Caesar, who had, you know, spurious charges made against him, and he had to decide, okay, am I just gonna kind of get persecuted and try to hope for the best and, you know, maybe they'll let me live, or, you know, I can take a swing for it and, you know, come back and, you know, and, and fight. And, you right. know, I think we, we know what type of man Trump is. Right. Um, or maybe we didn't know. Like, I mean, frankly, before I saw him pump his fist, I, you know, I thought, yeah, you know, he like, frankly, 2020, uh, the January 6th stuff, that was not a uh, very like inspiring moment for a uh, a Trumpist for a, uh, right. you know, not, not, I think in the article that I wrote, I, I phrased it not as a, uh, Battle of uh, Alessia tier moment, uh, Battle of Alicia tier moment. I, I don't know how to pronounce that, but it uh, that was the climactic battle between uh, Julius Caesar and uh, the you know remaining uh, you know strongest Gauls led by Xerxes and Gederitz, and uh, and and he won. He beat them. And uh, but yeah, you know Trump in twenty twenty kind of just capitulated. And uh, but, you know, maybe he didn't really uh, we'll talk about that. Maybe he didn't really have much choice. I don't yeah, know. We did want to talk but about that. Yeah. yeah. But just to finish my point here, he uh, you know, since then, these various, you know, felony you know, trials and, you know, uh, various prosecutions, he um, and, you know, indeed, you know, combined with these recent assassination attempts, I think he, beyond any sort of, you know, um, uh, you know, sense, uh, heroic sense that he's the leader of the, you know, the forgotten uh, Americaner, which I think is true, but uh, beyond any sense of that, he must sense that um, in the, the words of uh, Game of Thrones, in the Game of Thrones, you, uh, you win or you... Well, I, I fill in the, the blank there. Yeah. And so yeah. he he understands what's at stake. And I think he uh he's you know, he's in it to win now. He's uh uh what do they say? It? It's uh in it for the biscuit or something like that. Right. No, no, absolutely. Um what risk it for the biscuit. That's it. Risk it for the biscuit. Yeah, risk it for the biscuit, absolutely. Without getting it all fed posty, what um, yeah, well, I do want to talk about go back to twenty twenty and January six because there is this common talking point that, and BAP says it, and, and my own skepticism surrounding this may a little bit have to do with my own lack of knowledge of or in depth, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? In depth 
you know, analysis of, of the circumstances. I do wonder what crossing the Rubicon really would have looked like on January 6th, really would have looked like in 2020. And I wonder what it would look like now. You know, what would he do mm-hmm. in office now? Um, so I guess, you know, kind of me lobbing a question at you, uh, in, in any order, mm-hmm. I guess this Rubicon question is interesting, right? Like, what would it have looked like in 2020? What could he done more? Or was it really just the deck was stacked against him and it kind of had to be this way where he had to leave and come back? I mean, that's maybe that's what history will show us to be the case. And then, yeah, yeah. What, what is the main, I did not to ask you, make you a courtesy or well, hype mouthpiece about I think there are... the government, but yeah. A few things that were at play in January 2020. Trump, um, obviously Pence could have um, invalidated the uh, whole process. And, you know, Trump, uh, you know, obviously, you know, tried to get him to do it. He wouldn't do it. Um, But, I mean, let's let's zoom back. Let's just, you know... um, before we we mm-hmm. get into what Trump should have done, let's talk about the 2020 election itself. There um, were all of these ballots counted late at night, and you know all of this, you know all of these irregularities, and right. it, based on all of the kind of bellwether signs at the you know at the beginning of the voting before the election it really looked like Trump was going to win. It's, you know, basically, you know, every sign, many signs pointed toward a Trump victory. But um, the, you know, massive surge in mail-in ballots allowed for an unprecedented amount of ballot harvesting to occur. And uh, in these, you know, Democratic stronghold cities, Suddenly, Philadelphia, late at night, produces, they know exactly how much they're losing by, so they can generate all of these uh, extra votes at late at night when no one is looking. A little little suspicious, right? A little suspicious. Absolutely. It's a less worthy of question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And now combine that with the challenges afterwards, the legal challenges. And Trump mentioned this in the debate with Kamala. He didn't lean into it enough. Um, the vast majority of these challenges were uh, of the kind of the voting laws that were made directly prior to the election to enable this sort of unprecedented uh, mail-in, you know, fraud, basically fraud, yeah. mail-in fraud. And they, um, the courts... The uh, these, you know, state courts, federal courts, um, you know, important, you know, this is not like, you know, a rinky dink, uh, you know, county, uh, you know, court. Often. These are like real big courts. And yeah. they said the issue, um, the issue is moot. Now, in, in right. law, when a court can decline to hear a case, um, if the issue for a number of reasons. And uh, one of those reasons, uh, you know, a court can decline, the judge can decline to hear a case, um, is that an issue that a litigable issue, an issue that can be litigated is uh, in the court's opinion moot. And what that means is it's already been settled. Yeah. That's the craziest shit in the context of a, a presidential election where this type of stuff happened where you know and they just the courts are saying oh yeah it's 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 moot you know it's already settled because it because it already happened because we are the news media already called it so it's like the yeah. news media working in concert with the democratic governors who you know pass and the democratic legislators who pass these voting the mayors, laws or and mayors, the mayors exactly. and the yeah, and, and everyone every working level. together to they even the daily beast wrote a goddamn article about this a feature piece where they talked about how their plan to save america succeeded well this yeah, yeah they did the, the media yeah. The judges, the legislators, the mayors, all of these people did conspire to um, do 
take the actions they took, which led yeah. to a um, a Joe Biden victory in 2020. And you only need to do it the, in a few cities, you know, Phil, yeah. this is going to be the case this year, too. I mean, uh, we'll talk more about 2024 later, but, you know, it's, it, it is going to come down to Pennsylvania this year. There's little doubt about that in 2020 was yeah but a little bit and the similar states here you know it's a little it's a lot of philadelphia it's a little bit of phoenix perhaps it's a it's a little bit of detroit yeah. but it's basically just a few cities um so, atlanta you know depending yeah, but yeah. So, to just circle back to your original question what could trump have done the thing is trump had to do a lot of this stuff before um before the election he had to have, yeah. you know, stuff he had to. I'm not saying like when I say like Trump could have, you know, crossed the Rubicon, he like could have, you know, summoned the military loyal to him and, you know, defended the January 6th protesters and, you know, mm -hmm. remained. In, no, I don't think that's not what I'm saying exactly. But he could have yeah. crossed the Rubicon by, I don't know. You know, there's there's a lot of levers of power in the federal government. I don't believe that when these states were passing these mail in ballot laws that he didn't have any leverage that he could use with these states. I don't believe that he didn't have any leverage. He couldn't he, he um, you know, uh, could have used yeah. with these courts. He may have with, as weird with as this media, is. To say it, yeah, even. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, as weird as it to say with the sitting president, I mean, he may have just not had any oversight and he, it may have been a blind spot. I think it probably was. Um, I don't I don't. Yeah, I I push back on the end. I'm not saying you're saying this. I'm not saying anyone's saying this. I don't want to sound like a, a, a total simp or something. I, I but I but I don't know if he really showed like any kind of cowardice at any point. I think it just wasn't prepared yeah um, well okay yeah. but i mean like so not exactly a battle of alessia moment like like i wrote uh right. like not julius caesar leading his troops to defeat the the to the, their final victory over the gauls like part of that is being incompetent so like absolutely julius yeah. caesar but, uh, won, no, no doubt no yeah doubt. <laughs> because he was extremely yeah. competent and he you know um i mean they were great at you know, a number of things, building forts, they surrounded the Gauls with these forts that they built, et cetera. And, you know, Trump just, you know, he, yeah, maybe it wasn't a lack of courage, probably wasn't. And probably if you're in that situation where you got rolled so bad on election day, what are you really even going to do in January? You're just kind of, you can kind of fuck. Yeah, well, so, listen, I, yeah, I, I lived it, and I was maybe I had my own. Not that I'm obviously not in charge of. Uh, I don't have any power. I'm not in charge of doing anything. But I, I felt too that this had kind of been as a Trump supporter at that time. Um, I felt too that I'd sort of been blindsided, and that I was. Left. I just imagine maybe it's no real comparison. But imagine feeling something similar to Trump in that moment. The morning after, you know, I'm in all these. It was in all these group chats, whatever. Um, you know, Telegram chats, whatever. You know, when it was clear that Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania had all gone his way and had all gone Biden's way and that Biden would win immediately, there was um, pushback. There was a sense of like, oh, he can fight this. He can fight this. He should fight this. And I certainly agree. I'm agreed. But I knew and I'm not saying I'm some special genius. I just, maybe I'm just too pessimistic. But I, I knew as soon as the media reported that he was losing, that it was over. The media has never said, whoops, we were wrong. Like, it doesn't really happen. Yeah. So, um, you, like, regardless, and uh, friend, friend of the pod, Isaac Simpson, kind of said something similar about, the, more dauntingly, he said it's about polls this year, where they're saying Kamala's winning, Kamala's winning. You know, polls have been wrong. They were wrong in 2016. So that's less damning. But it's it's not so much, is this true? With, with questions of, like, who's winning an election, who's polling better. The question often isn't so much, is this really true as does the media, if the, the fact that the media feels it can get away with saying it, it means it's pretty much already over. Now, I'm not that pessimistic. I think things can genuinely, 2016, you know, they got, you know, fucked and, and maybe they, they, but they, unfortunately, they, they, they doubled down since then. I'm not saying the media is like undefeatable, but I'm just saying like, it, if, if they, 
if they feel they are in control of the narrative, then that's a really bad sign <laughs> because they yeah. probably are. Because in 2016, when he the night I, you know, we all watched it, uh, it was very clear that um, you know they thought they had it in the days up to it, of course. But as soon as Trump started winning, um, that they had no control over the narrative, and that's what was so thrilling about it. And yeah. this could happen again. Uh, and and I think in some ways it sort of happened in 2020, but they had a lot of tricks up their sleeve. Um, yeah, that we were just underprepared for. One one thing I wanted to say, not to go off the script mm. here, not off script. Obviously, we don't use scripts. So I'll outline um, one thing worth noting. You know, I, I, you know, I'm not Alex Jones. Like, I, I think there's a there's a time and a place for like speculating what may or may not have happened. I must remain agnostic as to what exactly happened in terms of ballot harvesting. Like, I don't know if it's literally fake ballots. I have no proof of that. Mm. Obviously, I'm expressing an openness to the fact that that could be the case. Um, one thing I've heard from people who know a bit more about this, who are maybe not full on, you know, they may, maybe they don't think fraud happened on a massive scale, but all you need is to have it happen on a small scale. Mm. And you can flip an election uh, is that yeah. um, one thing and I'm, I'm not the expert on a lot of these details, but I know like one 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 very specific thing that most like most people would not say this is outright fraud, but it's at least borderline that they do, and they probably could have even done it on election day and night, given the you know when ballots must be stamped by sort of rules. Is um, I think this is like officially what ballot harvesting is defined as is when you go into like neighborhoods and you fill out ballots and you just have people sign them. Yeah, uh, this does exactly. happen. I don't exactly know on what scale it happens, but it's confirmed that it does happen, and it's confirmed that it has happened. Most people fight for the legality of it happening uh and i just think it's bullshit like i'll say that like a, a lot of people would say it's not because you know people are still voting um blah 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 Sorry, yeah I'm starting this thing here. um a lot of people um you know would say uh Sorry, I got distracted by texting me a second. No, no worries. A lot of people would say that's still like a valid way to vote. I'm not so sure about that. Obviously, um, th there's debate, but but my my ultimate you know opinion, as I always say, like I, I just think this whole thing with mail voting is, is nonsense, and you should have to register in, in advance. And I believe, without a good reason, you should have to do it physically, do it in person. Um, I do think election day should be a federal holiday. Like I'll I'll give people that. Like I'm not. Yeah. You know, obviously, I'm I'm a I'm elitist and reactionary enough to be like, well, I'm not sure if more people voting is a good thing. Like, I'll, no lie. Uh -huh. Like, obviously, I'm saying some of this because I think it benefits my side. But at the same time, like, I think I'm not really trying to get people to not vote. I just think that um, it should take some wherewithal to do it, uh, and that's how you that's how you get more genuine. Like, there there so there there are votes yeah. that are less genuine than others. Is what I should say, and. And I think it's a serious enough matter that people who are voting should have to make a pretty informed and conscious decision just on the logistics of doing that, which then for me stands in as that, you know, they're, they have the wherewithal to actually make a good vote as opposed to just signing a ballot. Yeah. I mean, crucially also prove you're a citizen. That's, uh, that's important to show up with ID and prove that you're a U.S. citizen because uh, non-citizens are not supposed to be able to vote, I don't think. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, beyond that, um, just to circle back to what you said with regard to um, Trump, Trump's chances now versus, you know, what could he have done in 2020? We went through that. You know, ultimately, he needed to be working on this much earlier in 2020 to avoid the, the screw job that he got. And what can he do now to avoid that screw job? Well, now, because he's not in control of any levers of government, uh, the Republicans are, obviously, and, and to some extent. And I think he does have a lot of people on the ground in Pennsylvania working on this so that's good and he is yeah. you know uh woke i know there's some laws the... have been changed you know I, I don't know exactly why i'm still think there's reason to worry but yeah some some things have changed right I, i'm sorry for something dumb i wish i knew exactly what it changed and where but my general sense is like they're still gonna yeah. probably try the same thing but there's some counties at least that have you know done what they can yeah yeah i think you know it it just goes without saying that 
the fact that he is not president anymore and he is not in control of the federal government gives him an extreme disadvantage vis-a-vis the power he could have exercised in 2020. So my analysis here is to win next Ne- next month, uh, you know, a little over a month from now, he needs, you know, yeah, he does understand what, you know, happened, I think, in 2020. He does have people on the ground working on it, but um, there's a limited amount he can do vis a vis what he could have done back in 2020. So to win now, he actually has to win big. It cannot right. be, if it's a close election, it goes to Kamala. If it's a close election at all, it, you know, even if it's a, you know, a medium, yeah. a medium election, it goes to Kamala. Um, but if he can actually, you know, score a blowout victory, which is, you know, based on some of these polls, potentially possible. I don't know. It's it's you know, yeah, in it's potentially it's possible. Probably the only it's going to be the only state that matters. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Uh, then then he can possible. win because yeah. the the margin of fortification the mm-hmm. we all know what the fortification yeah. is the the, yeah. the margin by which they can you know the you know generate the votes they need they can do that if they need like um 10,000 votes in Philadelphia they can't do that if they need a million votes in Pennsylvania. They just yeah. they don't have that type of margin. So we will, I think, very, it will be the case that on election night, we're going to know. Um, it'll be like, just like 2016. We're going to know whether Trump won or lost, because if it's coming up all Trump, um, yeah, yeah, He's going to win if it's, you know, if it's like looks like it's, you know, uh, you got Virginia going for Trump. You got Michigan. You got, you know, oh, Wisconsin. Yeah. I mean, it, they don't my like point is like, yeah, forget it. my yeah. point <laughs> is that like in the yeah. middle of the night, all that can change if it's, you know, if it's close, if it's leaning Trump. But if it's like, you know, like, you know, if he's like really pulling ahead in some of these states, yeah, then it's going to be a different story. They're not going to drag it out. They're not going to be able to drag it out. They're going to have to, it'll be like 2016 again. They're going to have to, you know, um, say, you know, uh, congratulations, President Trump. Now, if it's the opposite, if it's like close, we're going to see the same thing as 2020. We're going to go to sleep and we're going to learn, oh, yeah, grossness. we yeah. found, yeah, they there's a pipe burst and we found all these extra Kamala ballots, oh, which were yeah, yeah. buried in the pipes. <laughs> well, who knows how they got yeah, there, but yeah. they just, no, you know, they physical, exploded into the room. Yeah. <laughs> I have a physical reversion when I hear the term batch of votes, because I remember that being kicked around. So I just like, what, what does this mean? Like, where are these? Yeah. Like big truckloads that people find pulled over on the highway. I, it's just very gross. And um, abstracting from politics proper, I've been saying this like it's um, it's it's the ruination of a once great sport, American politics, to have it come down to these long, drawn out counting of ballots as opposed to knowing yeah. who won, whoever it was. Listen, I've like uh, I, I've known that I was not a Trump supporter in 2016. Like, uh, and, and I, so it wasn't really, I wasn't really like fully on board. Uh, um, yeah. but, uh, was but I? that was, a, that, yeah, that, that, that election was exciting to see as, you know, there was an energy. I'll just say this, I guess to throw a bone to our non-existent left-wing listeners, but like, you know, obviously Obama 2008, like, uh, that was exciting for people. Like that's what the elections yeah. used to be. Uh, and now yeah. it's this terrible drawn out process, or maybe it won't be. I mean, I'm really hoping for the best, obviously, uh, on November 5th. Um, yeah. But but we'll see. Yeah. I think this is actually a very good segue because we're talking about Trump in order to win. He has to win big. Well, how how is it that Trump is going to win big potentially? And I think that's a very good segue to talking about 
Trump as a demagogue, but also Trump as, you know, I discussed in my piece, as we've discussed together, Trump as an artist, Trump as a, um, you know, a performer and how he's managed to, uh, you know, you know, if you, if you're not a Trump fan, you say, uh, you know, hypnotize. If you are a Trump fan, you say enchant half of America. So, yeah, I think this is a good time to talk about that. Trump's ability to um, perform, to, you know, enchant large groups of people, that is his ticket to actually winning in 2024 because he needs to win big. And the way he does that is by just being, honestly, being Trump and you know, hoping that that's enough in 2024. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, you know, doing these, uh, the, the good old boys, they recently contrasted this election w with the uh, election in 1896 between William McKinley and William it's Jennings true, Bryan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, yeah. And William Jennings Bryan and the popular like McKinley, it was famously like a, um, uh, uh, front porch campaign where he didn't even campaign just all the powerful people said you vote for McKinley he like you know held court on his front porch reporters talked to him a little bit but he didn't really go out whereas William Jennings Bryan was barnstorming across the country in stadiums or you know concert halls whatever people came to see this populist speaker talk about you know um, how America, you know, needed to, uh, change to, you know, um, better reflect yeah. the needs of the common man. And, um, yeah, I think there's a real parallel to Trump here. And I think Trump, um, as we've discussed, he, um, I mean, I've, I've said it before that I think he's the funniest comedian of the 21st century. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. I'll stick to that. I mean, like, I like Sam Howe. Yeah, no, he, he but, always, uh, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> he yeah. connects with audience. He, you know, obviously connects with audiences and um, it's a big part of his goal. Now, of course, William Jennings Bryan lost, right? No, I, I don't mean to bring yeah. that as a, yeah, so that's the, yeah, yeah, that's the did. bummer there. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that, the, the tenor of the election has not necessarily anything to do with the outcome. Um, and it sounds like the tenor there is similar, but, but if he does get past this, you know, margin of, uh, fortification um he can he can definitely do it uh yeah i'm just left in terms of my overall prediction not to not to um not to swerve away from talking about trump as an artist and as a comedian because that's i mean I'll, I'll say this like that is clearly a huge part of his appeal and less so on the comedian aspect but uh, but as a kind of artistic force i mean that is to circle back you know that is kind of the um the the point and the meaning and the the meat of of Constantine's book, um, and yeah. it certainly is all these things. Um, but yeah, in terms of my not to not to jump too far ahead here, but in terms of my overall predictions for twenty twenty four, um, I, I'm left scratching my head a little bit as to what to expect. It's like yes, I, I've seen the poll numbers. No, I don't think Kamala is a organic candidate in any way uh or that the appeal she has is super organic um i just think i partially there's like a few different ways i think it could go and i'm kind of prepared for all of them one of which is a um you know no i i will be somewhat surprised but happily surprised and maybe i, I don't want to say surprised because i'm not i'm going to remain agnostic as to what i actually think is going to happen you know if, if trump really pulls it out on night one they just have to you know admit it you know, in 2016 i mean yeah i'm not expecting that but I, but i'll love to see it if that's true the other more likely there you know the other more likely scenario which um could still involve trump winning is the more weeks long drawn out thing um and i'm kind of just prepping for one of those two scenarios i won't really you know in the in a scenario of it being drawn out like 2020 with Tom winning it's obviously not going to sit well i'm not really gonna think it was all completely above board and valid um but we shall see uh the other thing i was going to say though is things are so weird like you know maybe 
maybe positively, maybe negatively, I think we can also expect some degree of the unexpected, right? Like this could take some some funny forms, um, some surprising forms. More stuff can still happen. You know, the old in the in the old, more normal and civil days, there was the talk, you know, the, the concept of the October surprise in twenty sixteen. This was supposed to be the grab them by the pussy comment. Didn't really pan out that negatively for Trump. Uh, we'll see. I mean, I think there's going to be more. Is there going to be more assassination attempts? Quite possibly. Uh, God forbid any are successful. Obviously, you know, Secret Service has done a pretty terrible job so far, but they they can only be lazy for, or lazy is not the right word, but you know what I mean. They can only do whatever yeah. it is they're doing um, for so long. You know, I think Trump's probably not going to die before the election at this point. That'd be a massive that that would be that would that would be pretty controversial. How incompetent you'd have to be to let that happen to so many yeah. people are taking shots at. Um, but I do think you know I think there's still there's there's not much time before the election, but there's still uh, you know a bit of a, a winding road and a lot can happen. And I do think things. I mean, I hope frankly that thing that that not, that that there's some unexpected stuff that comes out that changes the narrative a bit. You know, earlier in the show, and it's become the wisdom on. Twitter, it's like it's definitely going to be Pennsylvania that decides it. But who knows? Maybe, maybe we'll. You, these things often do have a way of changing faster than you realize. And maybe on election night, Pennsylvania will be called early, and it's all going to come down to Georgia. And maybe there'll be these, these states flipping the unexpected. Maybe he wins Virginia. That no one's expecting that. But like you know, there's still for his kind of well charted yeah. and almost annoyingly. And drainingly so, you know, covered and, and inorganic as many things the election seem to be. I, I do still think some unexpected stuff could still happen. And I hope it's in uh, Trump's favor. Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of stuff that, that obviously can happen between now and the beginning of November. I, you know, there's, you know, the world can deliver random events the people who are interested in this election can deliver uh, engineered <laughs> events. And I think, you know, both are, you know, Frank and frankly, both are likely, you know, random yeah. stuff's going to happen. They're going to, you know, try to, you know, pull more shit. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see exactly, you know, how it, it plays out. And, you know, I, if I had to bet, um uh, sad to say but uh you know don't don't bet against the house you know the uh right that's kind of my, my sense of control, it yeah the house they control no. the government Actually, they don't but they yeah. um yeah yeah well they yeah, don't control no, the, house, I, the true house of representatives right, but they yeah, yeah, yeah they do control good everything of a thing to say but yeah it's actually not true but um yeah uh we will see. And then we're not even talking about sort of down the ballot elections. I mean, who really cares on some level? I guess it would be great if it's Trump and, and the Senate and the House, but it's, it's mostly Trump. You know, that's, that's the main focal point here. Well, also, um, I mean, yeah. it's as many people say, this is a real inflection point election, especially for demographics, yeah. because Definitely. this kind yeah. of the open border policies you know, this is, you know, four more years of open border. It's just going to create uh, a demographic impediment to Republicans ever winning again nationally. Yeah. So it is a kind of make or break election in some shape or form. Um, yeah. I mean, that being said, to kind of like bring it back to something that I, I think is uh, less apocalyptic. Um mm -hmm. Trump as well, one of the things that I think, you know, if, if Trump is to leave the stage um, in 2024 and he won't really, you know, provided he knock on wood, he's healthy, everything. He won't really leave even if he loses. Right. Um, you yeah. Know, maybe he'll be prosecuted. But I, I don't think we'll, you know, this is the last we'll hear from Trump. One of the things that, you know, we'll miss that is so great is his humor his right. um the way the way it um it functions is that he i mean he has these quips like when he like was debating biden and he said like uh referring to biden i uh, i don't think he even knows what he said and yeah, yeah. stuff like that 
that like I mean, we didn't okay, even talk about that today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, if just the, the first, in, that was right before. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Yeah. If you're like a cat skills vaudeville comedian, that's funny. That's like something that you know a comedian would say to a heckler or something. But what makes it, and I said this in the article, the decline of the jest, what makes it transcendent is that this is the former president saying it to the sitting president during a live <laughs> presidential debate. <laughs> the the stage on which Trump delivers these lines elevates what are kind of like well-timed, you know, good vaudeville style jokes to this kind of um, uh, transcendently funny art. Right. And that's something that, you know, if we get, if we get Trump back in 2024, you know, as president, we're gonna have uh, you know uh, an, an artistic renaissance in comedy because we're gonna get four more years of this and it's gonna be beautiful it's gonna be hilarious you're gonna love it mm -hmm. and you know frankly even if we don't he's still gonna be saying really really funny stuff and no, he's still gonna have this kind of world historical significance so yeah. you know it's um Regardless of the outcome in 2024, um, you know, thanks to uh, Trump, at least we could still laugh about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you um, this is not exactly on the comedy element, but it is entertainment mm -hmm. and it is an interesting artistic identity, I guess. And it was more it's only less funny because it was more, I suppose, sentimental and emotional uh, because it was a mere few days after the attempt july but mm. did you watch the rnc i, I mean i i never watched oh yeah things, but i watched i watched the last day i watched a lot and, of it yeah um, yeah that was you know kid rock and uh, i'm not saying these are my favorite artists or anything but you know kid rock and um hulk hogan and the whole thing i mean that was uh that was a sight to behold and you know it, it, trump has been associated with this sort of like um lowbrow um in a lot of ways associated with the early 2000s kind of culture for a while. And, you know, and for a lot of more like elitist right wing people, there's a kind of semi irony about like it, you know, it's yeah. like they appreciate, they appreciate about that, that about Trump um, without necessarily it, you know, without it necessarily being their cult, you know, the kind of monster truck element of things isn't their cultural identity, but they appreciate what it does, et cetera. But I'll say watching that, it kind of it, it, in the emotions of Trump almost having been assassinated, um, it kind of underscored uh, that sort of appeal to, I guess, middle America, you'd call it uh, in a much more emotional yeah. light. I mean, there'll be there'll be there'll be a day you know, with or without Trump winning. There'll be a day as time always marches on for all of us. Obviously, the DNC is going to look pretty goofy, too. <laughs> but um there'll be a day when we look back and, and just even just at the RNC and think like that really was representative of, of the American cultural sensibilities that are no longer there. Um, so in addition to being very funny and very clever and perhaps even some of these deeper water, you know, Lovecraftian associations that Constantine inflects on Trump. I mean, it's also just that he represents that, you know, the, the american culture of the you know basically 80s through 2000s of which he was a, a big part you know leading up to the apprentice yeah. i mean i'm not this stuff Absolutely. isn't exactly uh the sistine chapel um but it is you know it is rooted to 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 a people in a way of life uh, it's funny as it is to say that um you know trump does he's the figurehead of that and um it's something that elitists on the left side of things are highly contemptuous of but uh I mean, yeah, how can you be so contemptuous of Kid Rock and Hulk Hogan and stuff in 2024? I mean, this, this yeah. is just, uh, you know, I, I get being annoyed by some of that when it was like really mainstream. But at this point, how can you not have some nostalgia for that and see that this is representing, you know, a force in culture that others would mute? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I saw the RNC as opposed to the DNC as something that was like very real and vital and these are people there who are like really there not for their jobs not for their you know but they really they believe in trump they believe in the 
American people, you know, they believe in America. And the, Yeah. you know, the DNC is just like, it's, a, it was a much slicker production. It, you know, had much, you know, the people sounded Scripted. much more Yeah, like yeah. they, yeah, like they should be, you know, politicians. It's, I mean, it had more politicians probably. And, um, but it did seem, you know, really uh, devoid of, you know, life and also devoid, crucially devoid of the stuff that makes America, America. Like, you know, there, I mean, I, I had a tweet about this last night that even if Trump loses in 2024, MAGA wins in the long run because the other side, the Democrats, they, um, you know, when, if and when their policies lead to some form of collapse, which I think, you know, frankly, it's just a lot of this is unsustainable. I mean, unless you get someone in there who's like a a blue Caesar who says, OK, we can't we have to close the border now. We have to institute this and that. Their policies are kind of like uh, a company that is overspending and over borrowing and giving out bonuses And they're not going to, it's not the behavior of a company that expect, where the executives expect the company will last. The executives at a company like that, they fully expect the company is going to go bankrupt and they're going to walk away with their money. And that's the way the Democrats treat America. They think Yeah. it's, you know, Yeah. we're going to, we're going to get ours. We're going to get our bonuses. We're going to, you know, give our freebies to our people. And then where, you know, when it all goes to shit, you know, well, we'll go to New Zealand or something. But OK, so, it, you know, that happens, you know, potentially. Who knows? We're looking really, really into the future here. Well, who's left? You know, the oligarchs, the money that all leaves um, you. MAG is still going to be here. They're, they're not going anywhere. And they still, you know, will believe in, I, I assume, in America. Maybe it's not called America. I don't know. But they'll believe in something that, you know, is uh, similar to the America that we remember. And they're, you know, they're, they're going to create it in, you know, at, at some time because, because they care Yeah. So be a vacuum about eventually. this country. Yeah. And the other side, the Democrats, they don't. care about this country they say so they explicitly say so their groups are like you know anti-american there are you know various Right. you know uh, constituencies uh you know they're you know um various ethnic groups of people who say they hate america so well you know when the glue that holds them together which is the oligarch money runs out well what are they gonna do what are they they're gonna build uh an america that hates itself No, they're going to I don't know what they're going to do. They're 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 fucked. Actually, the people who are, you know, right now seem to you know be getting the short end of the stick, the Americaner, the the MAGA crowd, um, you know, they're they have a common uh, belief. They have a common belief in a nation. And that's you know, Yeah. that's not going to go away. The you know, the same way any group of people who are like disenfranchised, who have been in uh, in exile, <laughs> shall we say, Mm but maintain a, a core belief about, you know, we have a, 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 a you know, people, a, a nation that we want to, you know, uh, you know re, uh, revitalize, reenact, um, you know, they'll, they'll do it at some point. So, -hmm. Yeah. you know, even if No, Trump I think that's doesn't a good point. win Yeah. in 2024, Um, MAGA wins in the long run because Yeah, MAGA as a believes as a in America. collective identity for sure, which is something that's lacking. And um, I don't know if we're moving towards kind of winding down here, but but in addition to that, as a kind of optimism, another thing I'll say that I think you know maybe goes against a little bit of my you know fears expressed earlier about ballot harvesting and the fact that if you have enough money and media power, you can kind of decide you know the results of the election in, in so many ways. Um, you know, that's all true. But at the same time, let, let's remember the mask does slip and it slips often. It's slipped recently. Um, they are powerful, but they're not all powerful. 
Um, I genuinely think, for instance, the Biden refusing to drop out, saying he would never do it and then doing it. I mean, I think that was a very much a mask slipping moment where they did not oh, yes. have yeah. control. Um, so if they can sort of screw up, I mean, they've, I suppose, I, I don't even want to say this, but I suppose they've done an okay job rewriting the ship there. Uh, you know, everyone's coalescing behind Kamala, sure. But at the same time, that was a bit of a, certainly the debate, which we didn't even talk about, the the, Bi- the last ever, you know, Biden, they'll never talk again, <laughs> the last ever, um, you know, Biden and Trump uh, debate. Um, what was it? Was a yeah. gap on their part. And, and pretty much everything that happened over the next several weeks um, including, you know, Trump gaining some, 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 some ground in a way because of the assassination attempt. That was, you know, July was a very, it was a very good time in Trump's camp. And, and, and oh, that's, yeah. you know, their mask was slipping. They read the ship because they can, they're, they're good at PR, right? But like, yeah, if the mask could slip in July, it can also slip in November and they, they could lose and not have any way of writing the ship. Um, so I think, you know, I have plenty, plenty of hope um, in that regard. Yeah, I mean, crucially, no one's in charge. Um, they, you know, they have a kind of sense making in the in the Yarvinist sense. They have a um, a sense making apparatus: the universities, the media, the political class, the the elves, as you want to call them, uh-huh. the elite. But um, there's no one calling the shots. So no, you yeah, have genuine, I, sometimes. Right. Like I sometimes act and think that there is someone calling the shots, but there's not. Sorry for interjecting. I just that's that's part of what I want to yeah. say is like as powerful as they are, it is not some, you know, it's not someone playing a chessboard on high at all. Yeah, it's just, you know, if you go up against the machine, you're, you know, at a, a big disadvantage because they have all these levers of power. But one of their big disadvantages is um, they don't have a leader and they don't have any real beliefs. So yeah, <laughs> if yeah, your belief true. is just like, I want to get mine, I want to get Gibbs. And I, yeah. I don't say that to denigrate like uh, the, the lump in proletariat. I'm thinking more the, uh, the Gibbs for the uh, politicians, the, yeah. you know, the, the professors that they want their, you know, tenure, they want their uh, executive director position at the BS NGO. And that's mm-hmm. why they're voting Democrat. Well, that's really ultimately when you run out of that, when you run out of stuff to give people, um, it all kind of falls apart. And the other side, the, um, you know, as we just discussed, the MAGA side, they, um, okay, they don't have the same, they don't have control of the sense-making apparatus. And so that's a very big, big disadvantage. But what they do have is they have a common belief in um, uh, America. And they, right. they believe themselves they to be a, a nation. Yeah, yeah, rather than just a, they have a leader. Your head. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they, you know, they have a, um, a sense that they are all in this together as a nation. Whereas, you know, you take uh, some journalist from MSNBC and you take some uh, Antifa foot soldier and you put them in the same room and it's like, oh, uh, so what, you know, you, what are you guys working toward? And one, one of them is going to be like, oh, I'm, I hate this guy. And the other one's going to be like, ah, oh, yeah, I, this guy kind of smells bad. I don't agree with his politics. And, you know, it's you put two like Trump supporters in the same room. They're going to agree on a lot of stuff. And yeah. that, you know, yeah. that's really that is powerful. And that's that's something that, you know, they wish they the Democrats wish they had. And no, can't that be kind of thanked. unity and shared vision. Absolutely. Um, so there there is a, there's definitely a lot of uh, cause for hope. Other other soundbite I wanted to get in, um, you know, obviously, we've always been talking about ever not just every presidential election, but every midterm election since 2016, as you know, it's, it's almost tired, you know, that it is a great inflection point, but um, it's kind of said by both sides. Uh, but it is true. All of these elections are big inflection points. And um mm-hmm. It would have been better to end, I guess, on 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 our note of optimism there. But um, but I just wanted to to say this because it occurred to me while you were saying it. Like, yes, you know, as a Trump guy, like 
immigration demographics, really, really important. But I would say even more important or as important or really going along with this demographic question. Um, and I'm sure Trump's I can I can only imagine, you know, after 2020 that he would be on top of this. Um, yeah, changing changing the voting laws uh, and getting rid of some of these loopholes with ballots. Um, I, to me, for me, that's maybe even, oh, if, if only because it's a sh probably easier and quicker fix. Um, that's that's as important as the immigration issue for the yeah. of this country. Because I mean, we can have not even to get into you know what's desirable and not. You know, there can be there can be immigration, but like as long as as long as you're setting it up so that the most responsible and invested people in society um have more power rather than just you know any 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 joe off the street you know being able to just sign a ballot whatever um that, that i should probably yeah. edit that sound a bit a bit i don't want to i don't want it to sound too much like i'm you know no no i know what you mean loading no. but you know what i mean like as long as long as we can keep incentivizing and and, and rewarding uh, even in democratic, you know, voting terms, perhaps to an extent, people who are more invested, um, then, 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 then there's still a fight. But when you depower people who are invested, I think that's when things uh, go south even further than they do with demographics alone, which as you know, it's a distant right podcast here. Uh, obviously, I think demographics matter a lot. But, um, but after 2020, and not just after 2020, but after 2022, and the way we see um, these elections pan out, um, it's just very dire, I think, to, to you know, to so straighten that out. I yeah. think a, a good sign there with regard to being able to um, potentially pass legislation that will safeguard voting integrity, stuff of that nature, is um, the Trump 2016 team his first administration team it was you know you had some true believers who were uh not really um politically equipped to get the job done but they believed in trump and you had some political operators who didn't believe in trump and sabotaged him and what i see this time around is the situation has changed so much in this country that you have very savvy and powerful people who are, I think, aligned with Trump now ideolo ideologically. Yeah. So the biggest I example of this yeah. is Elon Musk. But you right. also have right. Bill Ackman. You also have, well, I mean, Peter Thiel originally was. He still is. Um, you Great have, fighter, um, yeah. yeah, you, you have big players big players in the um you know so yarvin refers to them right as the dark elves well yeah. there weren't that many dark elves back in 2016 they were all like maybe uh underground but now the dark elves are walking around in the sunlight saying hey i'm a dark elf and that will actually you know not uh that yarvin is right about everything uh, um, you know, but in this instance, I, I do think um, he, he does have a point that you do need some, you know, power players who understand the way the system works, the way the regime works to be on your side, because frankly, if Elon is on your side, if Bill Ackman is on your side, if Peter Thiel is on your side, yeah. if Mark Zuckerberg, it seems like he's, you know, he's more amenable to, I don't think he's endorsed anyone yet, which in and of itself is an endorsement. If you have people like that yeah. on your side, Jamie Dimon, if you have Jamie Dimon on your side, um, you have a situation where you have people who, um, you know, they have no incentive to betray the elf class, really. They, yeah. you know, they could just, you know, certainly life would have been a lot easier for Elon if he just, you know, shut the hell up, never bought Twitter, collected his checks and, you know, did whatever. But you do have, so I, so this leads me to believe that Elon, Bill Ackman, Teal, uh, Jamie Dimon's been expressing support. Like all of these people, you know, they actually do believe in 
MAGA. They believe in yeah. Trump. And okay, yeah, maybe they have, they have plays. They have personal plays. They think they're going to make money off of it. They probably will. But, you know, yeah. the safer move for any billionaire is to just, you know, shut up and profit from the system. And so these are these are people who, you know, the people who were on his team who were like real movers and shakers in the in the elf community in uh 2016 <laughs> they were not dark elves like the goldman sachs guy he wasn't a dark elf uh what was it cone something cone um the uh you know mcmasters uh he wasn't a dark elf uh right you know these uh, the oil guy, uh, his secretary of state, Rex Tillerson, he, he wasn't dark elf, but now he has these people. He has these people who, um, you know, I think there's always going to be a good reason to bet on a team that has Elon Musk on it. Absolutely. Yeah. They're some of the world's just men and as we kind of talked about on our previous uh jd vance episode like this this dark elf thing it took a it took a while maybe uh maybe some of us wanted to see it happen faster you know it very much didn't happen 2016 17 but it, it has happened you know there are there are people of means and of good standing in society who um who are on team trump you know sometimes a little bit under the radar maybe some people are secretly like maybe, maybe that's the case with zuckerberg now i don't know not a huge fan of his, but like his recent political turn has, has been interesting. Uh, and then there are people yeah. who, are, who are very overtly on top of it, like Ackman, like Musk, like um, humbly, you know, some some people in our sphere, maybe less so in terms of being big money donors, but, you know, in terms of controlling the economy, you know, in terms of offering an alternative voice that's found a more, um, more, more of a mainstream home than it had previously, you know, it's not all you know, conservative commentators, this there's red scare even, you know, not, you know, I, yeah. I think that was another recent moment, this thing in New York, you know, there's people in our sphere who are, you know, kind of over the dime square, red square, red scare thing. But like, I guess I'm not because when I saw that they talked and I don't think he will, but when you know, that sound bite of Trump, they like, have your people talk to my people. I'll come on. I mean, that, that was so exciting to me. I mean, yeah. just the fact that they went to that New York bar and gave burgers very in character. That was a, that was a very, uh, when was that even? A few weeks ago. Very, very, very fond moment oh, yeah. for me to, to witness. And, you know, there there are these institutions like Red Scare and, and like Tucker's audience. You know, it has grown, this thing of, of being, you know, a dark elf, as it were, pro-Trump, um, without necessarily being just another Republican, but rather in, in a more sort of um, clear-pilled, I guess you could say, way about viewing him and, and supporting him. Uh, that That has certainly grown. Yeah, agreed. It's, you know, not just power players, but part of the, you know, the, there has emerged a whole, you know, segment of the culture that is um, a segment of the avant-garde portion of the culture that is, you know, pro, pro-Trump, pro that is MAGA. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, what is, what is more, okay, and this is going to, sound uh i'll probably have raked over the coals for this but what is more elite than a dime square party it's a pretty elite thing actually <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah, well, no, yeah. i mean it's, it's true like i mean these are people Absolutely. who are like you know uh in the the art and literature world they're the kind of the punk rock you know uh version educated, of what's going yeah, whatever educated yeah, yeah. but rebellious this is like this is stuff that people will write about 20, 50 years from now. People will write about Sovereign House 50 years from now. And that's like, you know, I, okay, people are going to say a dance simping here. I, yeah, I, there's, I no one, there's no one I'm yeah. simping for. I'm not simping for like Moldovan or, you know, oh, I mean, not that I dislike him, but it's just, it's true. It's, uh, you know, this is a nexus for you know art and culture and there's the same stuff going on in la there's the same stuff and to the extent that this you know kind of avant-garde of the uh cultural elite is uh, um pro trump that's not nothing that's that's something and that did not exist in yeah. 2016 it that certainly did not didn't, really and, um, yeah they're definitely not simping for anyone but like yeah credit where credit's due it's you know 
Jack Mason was calling out Comtown for being evasive on this issue, but like in terms of uh, Red Scare, or at least Anna, you know, she she has endorsed Trump. You know what I mean? And I do appreciate that because there was a there was a thing for a minute there where it was like, you know, you know, waste, you know, sort of um, nebulous times of like twenty 2020 twenty through twenty twenty two. There was a lot of like, well, these ideas are interesting without necessarily endorsing but you know anna's is fully on team trump i think dash is too i think red scare is and that's that's the vibe of of what dime square is and uh and it's yeah, great you know it's uh, like yeah there's things people get tired of having the same people in their feeds they have this that and the other qualm with this that and the other person but like you got to recognize the forest for the trees and what it is is um you know there's still there's still this energy that is pro-trump there's wind in our sails, Matt. Absolutely. Blowing us onward. <laughs> <laughs>